people who don't know what you know northeastern state uh, northeastern hill university yes sir yes yes northeastern hill university yeah. yes so uh, this university is located in the beautiful uh, place of shillong uh, so he is from uh, he is he will be speaking from uh, shillong meghalaya so um, uh, we welcome you sir and uh, i i know and i hope that uh, this session will be very interesting to our participants and definitely sir is from the discipline of political science so uh, there are participants who are not who are who are not from the department of english so uh, so you know it will be it, it will be very useful for those participants as well as the participants who are from the english department because we believe in interdisciplinarity so i am looking forward to listening to your lecture sir so uh i hand over the session to you sir uh, right thank you very much uh, prathusa for saying so many warm words about shillong and uh, and uh, the northeastern university but you know basically we are all teachers uh, whether young or old we all belong to the same profession and our idea is uh, our most uh, uh, important responsibility is to probably move the academic agenda forward so as the, so as to help the society to grow in a very balanced manner i think in that context while uh, i was listening to the partition study uh, you know the the while partition studies do have their own limitation but they also have uh, kind of a great dangers uh, embedded in it where people are uh, often reminded of the kind of gory tales which has uh, you know which have taken place in the past and if you most remember probably that could be coming up in our own way of you know going further i think in in political science why i talk about it because you know when you talk of a discipline called uh, political science or you call it policy science or you call it uh, governance studies you know this this is primarily uh, you know futurist uh, it has a futuristic agenda where it wants to build up a future rather than talk of the past i think you know every discipline has but then the, this discipline is the most important simply because as we know that uh, when we talk of uh, building up our own society where uh, we'll talk a little bit about pandemic now and where we'll see that we need to build up our own house in order rather than merely start uh, having a blame game which is often seen in the context of retrograde politics i i come from the discipline of political science uh, we we have to understand as to how our politics is being governed in our own country in our own society and also in the rest of the world and and whether uh, any kind of a change that comes up uh, in the in our own times in our own life times or in the times or in the life and times of our future generation whether it will really help us uh, to build up a society that we are looking forward to we should be as we say in our own discipline which will be well governed which will be prosperous and also which will be uh, non discriminatory i think you know non discriminatory as a theme is probably quite embedded in the study of political science in the study of various disciplines uh, which are within the subject of political science and uh, and that context you know since politics tends to involve you yeah, know you know politics is the uh, as we call it politics is the art of uh, power i uh, you know and that is what the political science has been defined that uh, whosoever knows how to exercise uh, power properly would prove to be a good political leader uh, which we don't say politician good political leader uh, and who doesn't know how to uh, exercise power probably would be left behind and which would probably part of the memory i think you know the topic that uh, i will be talking about here uh, and one of the most important component of uh, of our uh, so so called within court representative politics that we have in our own country which is what uh, is known by the broad name of democracy uh, we will be talking about rethinking ethnicity and when you talk about ethnicity uh, and why does it why does it have to be reworked why does it have to be rethought about and uh, why what are the dangers if we hang on to the traditional beliefs of beliefs which have been propagated about uh, ethnicity or about ethnic uh, ethnicity as a cultural term in our own society and we also have to see as to whether the present day challenges uh, really uh, they pose us a challenge as uh, as very creative thinkers within our own discipline or we need to look beyond it i think you know uh, the you know when we when i i have been living in the northeast for the last 25 years you know it's a one of the one of my most important uh, learning creative period when i came from delhi here to understand as to uh, to understand as to how the northeast region is being governed and what is the basically lies in all these societies Uh, and in, so when you talk of societies you know i don't talk of society because as you know there is a debate whether india is a nation or is india is india is a nation of nations so each of the when you talk of nations we also understand each of the ethnic uh, community they can also be classified as a nation uh, provided 
they have developed an idea about this the task of governance about a political future the moment ethnic communities tend to have come up to a stage where they have decided about uh, they have some ideas about a political future about political destination or political destiny they tend to become nation so whether india is a nation or a nation um, or nation of nations that debate is still there but uh, if Indi if we believe india is a nation that uh, will be pointing out uh, that that uh, they will be pointing out our attention towards the creation of what to call is nation building and uh, you know where all the nations tend to get into a kind of a national integration framework where we tend to feel a nation like a sense of oneness with each other uh, ethnic uh, each other each other community uh, which which may be different from each other on the basis of ethnicity and i think you know and then yeah, so nation building uh, national uh, national building and national integration tends to be a kind of a post um, uh, independent uh, india's project where all the communities are now trying to be woven into one particular nation where probably the so called india as a nation could become stronger could become uh, more developed uh, where it will be able to uh, uh, you know fulfill the values as they have been laid down in our, in the prefer in the in the in the in our own india's constitution and which is uh, which is there uh, in the preamble i think you know and all those values which have been spelled out in the uh, in the preamble uh, tend to be directed towards you know uh, making us forget our so called traditional ethnic boundaries and and try to get co-opted into a new kind of a new kind of a boundary a new kind of a bond which will help us to strengthen our own identity as well as the uh, identity of the country so i think you know when you talk of uh, ethnicity i know that whenever you come to northeast when you when you study of northeast or when you go to any fora talk of northeast india northeast india a uh, very significantly tends to uh, tends to exhibit the kind of diversity which is there in the rest of the india too and when you talk of north in india being a, a diverse uh, society or a diverse region uh, doesn't take us uh, our attention away from the fact that india is a multi ethnic multi religious multi communal um, multi communal country uh, where each one of us has uh, irrespective of our ethnic uh, identity tends to have been uh, assured a place under the sun to uh, live uh, in equality to live with a sense of justice and also to to be able to uh, practice uh, and uh, practice a culture of brotherhood amongst us brotherhood also the, when the constitution makers wrote they were not very feminist uh, in orientation feminism came up in the late uh, independent late 1947 where probably the women group who tend to call themselves feminist very very you know, and families also have different kinds but then uh, let's understand that the women group uh, or groups who, who call themselves feminists tend to have said that well this brotherhood doesn't include sisters so you have to have another sisterhood which is where feminism went for the uh, for this segregation of the term and and probably for case of new identities so here you know when when we are talking about it we understand that as the academic discipline tends to have grown further with the uh, with the intervention of new knowledge with the intervention of new technology with the intervention of you know new kind of developments which are coming up in the world which also today includes the uh, the information technology uh, we tend to be uh, focused on creating more and more separate identities than uh, than than the identities uh, that were there in our own uh, history or in our own society so here when you talk about it we tend to understand northeast tends to be uh, geographically diverse uh, although it tends to be called uh, a kind of a region of eight states and as we see that uh, this is probably one of the uh, one of the richest state in terms of uh, the linguistic heritage that india can boast of i think the positive thing uh, and then i think when we finish it we'll come to know what are the issues we need to focus on but let's understand uh, the both the positive and the negative aspects of a region from the from the lens of ethnicity uh, or from the lens of ethnic boundaries and uh, and we find that uh, uh, often when when you talk of uh, northeastern india people tend to point out that well you know the the tribal communities tend to be not the same they tend to be different from each other that you know we understand that that is true that the tribal communities do uh, come from the uh, come from the come from the actual from south east asian side and uh, and they tend to also speak uh, tibeto burman or sino burman languages which were very different from the languages that was being spoken uh, by the so called uh, you know people who were living in india um, before the tribal communities migrated into india and we know that there have been various reasons as to why they migrated and 
and and also we need to understand that uh, that the, the the continuous migration of uh, migration of people from the you know from the southeast asian uh, region and who tend to speak uh, tibeto burman or sino burman languages who tend to be different from the cold of rest of the india australoid uh, uh, anthropological identity tend to have given this region and the country a kind of a, a diversity which probably no other uh, country in the world even in the 21st century can boast of so when you talk of the north east india you know often we find the speakers uh, tend to focus on the kind of divergence the differences the difficulties and also the kind of you know the kind the kind of negative factors which are associated with uh, our own so called political jargon rather than tend to focus on the kind of issues where uh, which need to uh, which need to be focused on because of the positivity or the positive uh, impression that will give to any thinker any researcher and or also any other sensible uh, sensible person and here you know when you talk about uh, the region we know that uh, the region tends to uh, be is, uh, tends to be tends to have 220 tribal communities as we say and they tend to have equal number 220 number of 220 220 languages and also as we call it uh, ethnic groups that are the, those who are residing in the north east india so that way even if north east india is connected with a what you call it with a narrow corridor with the rest of the india which is called uh, famously chicken neck but still north east india tends to be uh, can be can be also classified into a kind of a region which the rest of the india probably cannot be boast of so given the given the diversity of languages given the diversity of uh, dialects or the cultures that we tend to have uh, and north east india Uh, in, uh, in addition to being a uh, hot spot, biodiversity hot spot, one of the seven or eight biodiversity hot spots of India, it also tends to be a kind of a, if we are allowed to say, some kind of a cultural uh, biodiversity uh, spot also uh, when compared with the rest of the world. So that way, you know, uh, anything that happens in the north is tends to occupy the attention of the um, attention of the not only of the Indian leadership uh, and also of the world. Simply because that uh, the world has tends to become one. We know when McBride talked about India being a global village, and when at that point of time, I think uh, we have gone through the book and we have seen that at that time we didn't understand that because we had been uh, we had got used to a kind of urban lifestyle, urban lifestyle in the sense of city-based lifestyle, uh, which was being uh, created or which was being set up in gross negligence of the rural areas of the country, uh, and and also. and also by overlooking the gandhian idea of india lives in the villages which probably called for more development so this urban style of living tend to have made us more uh, more remote from our own fellow uh, brethren who were living in the village villages and since we are living in the urban areas we had come to uh, classify ourselves to be more advanced to be more cultured rather than uh, the people who tend to live uh, in the in the villages and we also find the same feeling and that same feeling tends to permeate in our mind when we tend to think of uh, the people who tend to live in our own neighborhood when we talk of neighborhood it is not only mere mere neighbors uh, you know and when we talk of neighbors we have to understand that the neighbors also tend to be uh, coming from different kind of ethnic uh, ethnicity different kind of uh, social groups different kind of classes and and also different kind of different kind of cultural boundaries and that is where Uh, you know when uh, when you talk about north east asia we also have to understand that uh, when you come to ethnicity we'll see that ethnicity probably is being used uh, more in a kind of a segregated manner rather than in a unified in unified way where probably people could uh, would feel a sense of unity and when you talk of uh, unity we need to understand that india uh, india's constitution when it was erected in 1947 and uh, you know um, uh, and this in the in the so called constitution making uh making all the communities have played a very important role and uh, given the fact our history writing has taken place and uh, and given the fact there has been a dominance of the western educated elite and uh, and in the in the sense of hariness in the sense of hari history writing uh, you know some some communities have probably not been talked about as uh, in detail as has been talked about in the context of north east india uh, in the context of the rest of india and also probably in the context of assam i think you know and that is where Uh, when you talk of when you talk of social science we need to also understand that uh, uh, that when you talk of rethink when you think when you when you think of re rethinking the social categories where ethnicity tends to fall tends to happen to be one of the category we need to also understand that history writing also will play uh, rewriting history will also play a more important role in building up a sense of unity and integrity amongst all the uh, ethnic communities the, who may be residing in any part of the country including the northeast india i think when you 
uh, and uh, the northeast uh, uh, you know we will go, go to a little bit of british history we'll see that why uh, our sense of feeling uh, sense of identity or or our our uh, as we call it in our own political science penchant for uh, playing politics with the terms uh, with the terms tend to be more based on british history than on the so called independent history uh, history of independent india uh, we all know that you know the britishers did uh, play play a kind of a role which was quite expected of them because they were colonizers they were colonial people they did not have and they came to india as traders and later on they and they had to go through those political processes because they were trying to establish and strengthen their uh, power of control over the uh, over the indian colony and hence they had to engage uh, in a kind of a different kind of a governance system which was uh, most to their liking and uh, which was suitable to their own orientation which was also economically useful to their own country to their uh, motherland that is called great britain rather than uh, any way suitable to the country to the colony which uh, colony that uh, they were governing so here when you talk about the british history we know that the that the ethnic groups of the north in india although they tend to have uh, origin in south asia uh, and tend to have come primarily from myanmar uh, china and thailand we know that uh, uh, that uh, the the way they and this this region was found to be very very difficult to govern simply because that uh, uh, the britishers uh, didn't uh, and britishers were going into those areas where they had all the kind of assurance of economic benefits and primarily what you call it business, profit in business and since they were traders they were looking to uh, sell thing uh, looking to looking for trade connections and uh, they were trying to uh, they trying to execute as much profit as they can by look by trying to trade with the uh, with the local population and 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 uh, and up to that extent the british state had made inroad when you talk of north east india we need to understand that the the so called british state was probably typically absent from the north east india and north east india i think when you talk of the absence of the state uh, the british state because we know when you talk of the rest of india the british state was quite, quite bit paramount and if you if we read about the british history uh, in 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 the then uh, colonized india we will see that how the rest of the india was being subjected to the british style of oppression where the police were being unleashed where all kind of you know violence were being unleashed on the people uh, and the same was probably not at all seen in the case of north east india that is because the north east india you know they found that north east india was difficult to govern for them and there was nothing to trade they only came to assam then they came up to meghalaya simply because they thought that uh, these areas uh, were easy to easy to trade and uh, and also the area uh, had something to offer by way of uh, by way of trade where uh, when they came to meghalaya they came for limestone and salt and when they came to assam we know that uh, there, there were various other commodities where they were trying to and tea was the most important attraction for them so that is how and when they, they found that uh, beyond uh, meghalaya they did not really come to uh, come come deeper into the northeastern territory simply because they found it that there was they found it uh, there was nothing to gain by way of trade profits and hence the area should be uh, should be given the kind of a the governance should be governed in a way that was quite in keeping with the traditional way of governance and that uh, draws our attention to the excluded areas of act and also partial excluded areas act which were uh, which were being followed by the britishers where in the excluded areas of the act uh, you know uh, where they they tend to have made the village chief to uh, to rule over the uh, to carry on his uh, administration over the excluded areas uh, which were governed which were categorized under excluded areas act and uh, and the uh, and the partial excluded areas act which included assam and the parts of assam and meghalaya uh, or we call it the khasi and garo hills khasi and jaita hills we find that that these areas were were categorized as ex partial excluded areas act so why we talk of these two areas uh, simply because that we know then uh, wherever the british state was marching in terms of uh, establishing its suzerainty suzerainty over the over the local population these uh, uh, the northeastern india the including you know the partial uh, both excluded partial areas act were somehow uh, somehow had uh, gone through a different process of uh, state building where we find that this uh, where we find that the state was completely absent and it was uh, left to be governed by some kind of a traditional way of governance and uh, and we know that the the, the british uh, had acknowledged that the uh, the british had also acknowledged that the, this uh, area uh, that the kind of political boundaries that were there in the in the in during the british time during the pre independent india the boundaries were very very artificial and the, bound, the boundaries were very very artificial and they found it very difficult 
to to delimit the boundaries of the various regions which were part of the assam state at that point of time assam province as they call it uh, where were simply not very easy and hence they had just left it uh, to own and they knew that the kind of boundaries that they had, they were trying to talk about was simply not uh, in keeping with the so called uh, boundary studies that we understand when we delimit the boundaries of any particular uh, of any or any particular state or any particular society which will be given the kind of statehood in the future so where we where, when we talk about them we find that the and uh, i think i'll come back to a little bit uh, more about the history but when you come back to the britishers uh, here we find that the british uh, the british did not only acknowledge the colonial boundaries were very, very artificial which tends to have uh, uh, which uh, which created problem for the future generations in the post independent india we also find that the british also tend to have uh, the, the, tend to have also gone in for fighting various wars with the uh, with the so called uh, international neighbors like burma we find that the separation of the burma in 1937 and the partition of india in 1947 tend to have uh, created tend to have divided the tribal groups and tend to have made them scattered across the international boundaries so that in, in addition to the ethnicity problem that we found in the context of the british governance and in the in the, where they tend to have provided for some kind of a dual kind of governance uh, in the in the whole in the in the whole of india we also found that they are they are they are they are uh, way of uh, you know establishing uh, some kind of a political boundaries uh, with regard to within the assam province were also very very artificial and also we find that they are fighting wars in order to extend the british empire in the in the whole of indian subcontinent uh, tend to have also uh, come in the way of Uh, the simple uh, traditional living of the people which made them uh, divided across international boundaries which made them scattered across the boundaries uh, as 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 uh, the, they went on uh, winning the countries and also they went on separately giving independence to countries before india was given independence in 1947 so here we find so you know this kind of a situation created a, you know created a very kind of a bad uh, bad uh, memory for the people where people belonging to a particular ethnicity did not find did not find it very very convenient and also uh, and also culturally suitable when they were scattered across the boundaries when new states were created uh, in the so called post uh, in the, in the pre independent india and also in the post independent india so here you find that the that uh, and, and then you know the in addition to this we also found that uh, although you know there there is a section of indian uh, indian intelligence which which, which may be Uh, devoted towards praising the british actions but we need to also understand that their while their actions might have had some limited uh, impact in terms of the positive gains that indian india india nation gained in the post independent in, in, yeah i'm in the lecture hello yeah uh, what has happened is that uh, you know that uh, not only just one minute Uh, sorry there was a visitor and i had to attend this today being a working day but nonetheless we also un have to understand that in addition to the kind of uh, go uh, go governance system that they tend to have practiced in the in the pre independent india we also need to understand that uh, that the britishers are can also be held responsible for for uh, for for having created and perpetuated the ethnic boundaries that we seem to be existing within the uh, within and across the ethnic communities uh, who are residing in the so called present day india i think in this context we can we can quote uh, robert neil reed uh, who was a british governor of assam who uh, while talking of the hill people in the northeastern uh, indian northeastern indian region uh, tend to have said that uh, tend to have expressed his view i quote that these people do not uh, look like indian neither culturally nor uh, nor in origin nor in language nor in appearance nor in um, nor in tired nor in outlook and also uh very very uh, suckingly he tend to have said that these northeastern region people tend to have been 
uh, attached to India by way of accident. I think you know this kind of a understanding that the British governor and the who should remember that the British governors were also not very prominent. They were not the intellectuals who were who were asked to send to uh, govern uh, as British representative to India and the territory. They were simply being selected by the so-called uh, British uh, either by the British trading agency or uh, in, from 1858 by the British uh, government and where they seem to have uh, you know come up with very casual writing and since they were English they were so-called Englishized elite they were English speaking elites uh, who were who had the kind of a very high education potential in our own country tend to have uh, left some writings and history which tend to create more of a problem for us to understand each other uh, irrespective of the fact that we tend to belong to different ethnic boundaries. I think when we, whenever we talk about uh, ethnic communities, we find that people tend to be, even now as of today, tend to be co quoting the kind of writings of Charles Hemendraff or uh, Guerre or there are other British thinkers who have written about India and, uh, and that seem to be forming a kind of a platform for our own intellectual exercise. But the question is that while there may be, you know, some writings might have a limitation, um, might have some positive things, positive uh, things to, uh, to in terms of helping us in writing our own researches. But the question is that you know we should not be depending more on the negative writing because that was the the writing was such that it was the English people who came from Europe. It was the Europeans who were talking about Indians and were talking about the people who who, who lived in the non-European territories and who were trying to sort of leave some uh, impressions which were either they were very uh, settled, settled in the sense they were limited uh, by their own understanding they were also they had their own limitation given the fact that they were mostly administrators and not uh, any kind of intellectual uh, uh, mindset and they and that seemed to be creating for us any kind of a uh, any kind of a motivation for us to go in for a kind of a unified outlook by unified outlook i understand that since we are part of the part of the country we, we must have to remember that we have to be part of uh, a part of a country which has been which has come up in 1947 uh, willy-nilly despite the fact that uh, india india still uh, respects the diversity we need to uh, develop some kind of an understanding where probably more and more of uh, understanding can be brought up by our own researchers rather than merely uh, merely hinting on or insisting on our kind of differences either in terms of ethnicity in terms of uh, religious differences in terms of other kind of differences that are uh, that we can, we can find amongst our own people. But you know, and then uh, when we go to the state building, I think you know we we need to understand that the Britishers tend to if the, if we find certain terms having acquired a kind of a meaning. I think in European sense, uh, European sense, if any word which does not uh, uh, which does not undergo change uh, with the changes in the time tend to be called a monument. I think we all pass through certain monuments where we find when uh, the same monument tend to exist, if it is allowed to exist and is not broken or is not being shifted away, tend to be uh, existing in the same manner as we saw when we were a child uh, and, and when we see when we are already uh, grown up adults. So that way, you know, and why I'm saying is because I understand that the ethnic city that is being understood in the North East India tends to be uh, apply, understood and applied in a monumental sense rather than, rather than in a, any kind of a transitional sense that the would have led to the so-called, uh, you know, so-called merging of our different segregated, uh, you know, dissected identities into one blue, one broad identity, which could be Indian. I think, you know, and, uh, you know, we all, we also have a kind of a, you know, understanding in this region saying that, well, you know, we are, uh, since the British have said we are not part of the Indian, we don't look like Indian, we are, obviously, we don't look like uh, rest and, uh, and, and given the fact that uh, people, the, uh, you know, ethnicity, ethnic communities go through a lot of, a uh, lot of uh, changes, both genetically and also culturally, we find that uh, people tend to have acquired some kind of a multicultural identity. The multicultural identity may be different from multi-ethnic identity because we understand even if I am, you know, we now say we, even if somebody may be a born tribal, but if somebody stays in, uh, somebody may be born in Khasi, Maybe you know if he studies, he or she studies in Delhi, he becomes uh, he or she becomes a kind of a non uh, you know non tribal elite there, and then if he goes to he or she goes to work in a European country, he tends to become more European. I think, and then and that is where we find you know people tend to go through a kind of a stage in the modern times, a kind of a uh, to acquire a kind of a multi ethnic character, uh, then uh, then belonging to one particular singular ethnic community. So here when you uh, when you talk about these kind of uh, these kind of changes which have come up, 
I think we need to understand that the political process which has uh, which has undergone both in the pre-independence India and post-independent India right up to uh, right up to today, we can see that this politics probably has played an important role in either in the in the creation and perpetuation of a particular ethnic identity or in case of certain ethnic communities, the merging of the uh, ethnic uh, identities in case of certain uh, ethnic communities. So here we find, so when you talk of politics, I think we, we understand politics is the, also the art of the art of govern, you know, and uh, we also have, we also talk of, we also have a quote in our own discipline where, uh, you know, any office, any, any office can become uh, depending on what the office holder chooses to make it to be. So, you know, uh, and th that takes us to the uh, to the so-called politicians or political leaders who have uh, who in the past played an important role in the context of India's independence, and also um, they are playing uh, as important a role uh, today uh, in the context of building the so-called modern India and uh, in building it to be a kind of a modern, economically prosperous uh, and powerful country uh, as as of today. When you talk of India, we need to understand India is an emerging power. India tends to be. Uh, India tends to have undergone uh, so much of changes that India is now uh, not only a regional power in the Southeast Asia, India is also uh, being able to pose a kind of a um, uh, competition to China as far as winning over French in the Southeast Asia is concerned. Why talk of Southeast Asia? Because we all know that the tribal community, that the so-called ethnic communities which are who are residing in the Southeast Asia, in the in the in the hilly area tend to have become uh, tend tend to have uh, their uh, some kind of a ethnic um, Brethren, some kind of a, uh, you know, some kind of their uh, ethnic uh, uh, brothers or uh, uh, ethnic community relations with the people living in the South Asia, and that is where probably India was forced to play an important. Uh, in India was forced to come up with a policy which is there in the context of the uh, in the context of India in 1992, which is called Lucas policy, and the Lucas policy has now been transformed into Actis policy in 1990 in 2004, where India is trying to win over the so-called culture, India is trying to harness the cultural commonality which existed between the people of Northeast India with the people of Southeast Asia, where probably trade will be given a kind of a boost. But then why are we talking of this policy? Because the Indian government had to come up with this policy simply because the Northeast India, given the fact that given its geographical location, tend to have been treated in a very negligent uh, manner, tend to have been overlooked in the country's growth story and where probably uh, when people did not have anything to feel proud of being the citizens of the modern day nation, tend to be uh, tend to be forced to uh, go back to their ethnic identity, which tends to remind them of all the negative stories which were uh, the case in the uh, in the pre-independent India, and which should have been removed by the activities of the independent government of India. And here we find that the that uh, if at all we find that there have been uh, these new policies which have come up, which are supposed to be uh, providing people with a kind of a uh, with a kind of a hope and also realization of their dreams, probably then then people do, would not have to have uh, any more uh, way or any more dependence to depend on their own ethnic communities. When in political sense we talk about that, when you talk about these communities, we also understand that uh, that this kind of uh, dependence on our own ethnic. Primordial. I'm talking primordial because I don't, uh, you know, we have to also acquire some kind of a modern understanding about ethnicity, about ethnic communities, about about our, about how uh, our own story will have to be presented to the rest of the world. Uh, need to be paid attention to rather than merely uh, hankering on what has been in the past. So here, when when we when you talk of politics, you find that the politics of the modern India uh, uh, immediately after independence, you'll find that uh, although. In the north of India, we find certain ethnic communities were, were hankering for separation from India, but certain other communities were also uh, wanting to be part of the India. And also at the same time, they were trying to claim more and they were trying to claim more and more autonomy in, in the in the in the in the matter of uh, their governing the affairs of their own communities. And here we find so here we find there are two trajectories where we find that certain communities were trying to be part of uh, India. Uh, and we're trying to be part of India with a with a greater degree of autonomy, and certain other communities were trying to uh, demand secession, and that is where we find that the Naga uh, secessionist movement tend to have been very very separatist in the beginning, simply because they wanted while well, they, they they didn't want to be they didn't participate in the so-called statehood movement because they wanted independence uh, from India right after India gave, became independence. But other communities which were there in the northeast India, they were. 
they they had decided to be part of the so called indian uh, territory or, or in, indian men uh, indian territory and wanted to have some kind of a independence in the uh, some kind of autonomy which uh, they wanted uh, that they, their uh, cultural life will not be disturbed and that was what was promised promised by the by the constitution of india in uh, through the enactment of the sixth schedule i think the sixth schedule uh, was in for creation of a autonomous region autonomous uh, autonomous uh, councils uh, autonomous districts in the uh, in the in the so called assam province where uh, which later on uh, gave rise to the new statehood movement which was again uh, based on search for a new political destiny but they were they had already this they, but they, their dream was already attached to the existence of the uh, existence of the um, uh, indian territory but you know and whenever you talk of ethnicity we also know that separatism as we talk of in case of naga national council tend to have also coexisted along with the uh, along with the demand for retro autonomy uh, among certain other ethnic communities in northeast india vis a vis the, the act of separation and you know the the beauty of uh, uh, the uh, communities lies in the fact that that uh, many uh, while we talk of 220 ethnic communities looking living in the northeast india tend to have not uh, opted for separation while so a very selected number of communities given their own historical orientation demanded uh, independence tend to have uh, tend to have uh, led the indian state to realize that uh, probably a new kind of governance which was promised on the sixth schedule uh, has to be promised to them and which needs which calls for a kind of a greater orientation amongst the people where uh, not only the region would be uh, would be uh, under, given a lot of developmental activities and also the social distress that the people are falling up people are people are facing can also be removed you know when you talk about uh, this kind of a thing we know that there has been a, a great demand on uh, great demand for uh, autonomy uh, even now we find that uh, the sixth schedule which has been promised only to four states assam meghalaya manipur uh, assam meghalaya mizoram and tripura we find more and more autonomous tribal uh, communities uh, which are uh, which are existing in north india tend to be demanding uh, demanding the uh, sixth schedule recognition rather than Uh, rather than uh, demanding any kind of a setting setting up of the council which is not protected by the sex settle of the indian constitution you know and then this tends to present a picture as to why uh, people tend to look for central kind of a governance rather than the state le level of governance because they 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 probably uh, realize that probably the central level of governance tend to give them uh, more independence tend to independence the sense they tend to give them more autonomy in 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 enacting their own growth story in bringing in development to their uh, to their respective uh, geographical regions where they are residing uh, and and they are rather they rather feel a sense of discrimination with the kind of governance that is being enacted by the state government we all know that today when you talk of northeast northeast tends to be consisting of eight states and eight states tend to be protected by the india's constitution which they they tend to have their own autonomy to to rule over those area those uh, uh, those subjects which are listed under the state subject and also under the uh, state list and also in the concurrent list but then the question here is that why there is a, if at all they tend to um, be part of the same state way i you know more of the states uh, north states tend to have uh, been also uh, to some extent tend to have been created on the basis of ethnic boundaries i know that ethnic people Uh, ethnic communities tend to have been dispersed uh, across uh, across the state boundaries in india within india and they have been also been dispersed across the uh, international boundaries but nonetheless when the states uh, statehood movement uh, were led by certain uh, certain uh, ethnic communities and where the states have been created to fulfill the aspirations of the uh, of the same ethnic communities why within the state the ethnic communities uh, the same ethnic communities tend to uh, tend to demand the central governments rather than tend to opt for Uh, opt to be governed by the so-called state uh, government, which is of their own, and uh, you know, and that so that probably will be pointing out my attention that this continuance of ethnic boundaries is more of a problem of governance than of government. In uh, we know that there was a British author who tend to say, uh, who tend to have said that these uh, uh, the tribals, uh, were tribals didn't were tribals uh, opted for self governance rather than being state governed. I think there is a quote here. Uh, when you talk about it we find that uh, but then here when you talk about the governance and governed uh, people we find that while people wanted optimal self governance they still did not want to be state governed within their own state so here it tends to be pointing our attention to 
the problem of representational politics that we tend to have, which is known as democracy. We know democracy is not, although it is democracy is said to be of the people, by the people, for the people, but we all, the way democracy has been practiced, uh, uh, both in Europe and in the rest of the world, we find that democracy tends to have not been uh, able to fulfill the aspirations of people of all ethnic, uh, of all ethnic communities or race or, or any other social boundary as uh, probably was being hoped for within a democratic structure. So democratic structure, as we know, uh, tends to be governed by, tends to be dominated by the so-called elites of certain other communities. And here, the, the, the elites tend to play an important role in the context of, uh, in the context of uh, promising or issuing of good governance. And you, if you talk of the Northeast India, uh, when you talk about uh, the ethnic boundaries or the ethnic community, we tend to find that most of the ethnic communities tend to be uh, at war with each other. You know, why call it war? Because they tend to be fighting with uh, many other ethnic communities in their own vicinity in search of a separate homeland because they, they, they did not uh, get, they did not find they are living very easy simply because they were probably being governed by, by, uh, by the so-called elites of other tribal communities in the so-called multi-ethnic state. So when you talk about ethnic conflicts, we find that ethnic conflicts tend to be scattered over the, over the region and ethnic conflicts tend to be uh, merely a conflict between uh, any two or more ethnic groups, uh, contesting ethnic groups, which are uh, which either are uh, are led by a kind of a self-exaggerated uh, sense of uh, understanding about political, social, or economic differences, or they tend to rather exaggerate the differences, or they tend to rather be led by the discriminatory practices, which are even which are not only being uh, which are uh, being practiced by the uh, not only by uh, the non-tribal communities who may be residing in the in the in the vicinity or within their own state, and uh, and which is also being uh, seen to be practiced by their own ethnic tribal brethren, although they may be belonging to different ethnic community. So here we find so this democratic polity that has been promised uh, in India and that is that is still going on tend to have led the individuals of different ethnic groups into a kind of a conflict. But then if the conflicts tend to be a kind of a permanent uh, feature in the context of the northeastern India, we need to see that they tend this ethnic con conflict, if they become a regular feature, it's only because they, they, that these, these conflicts are primarily being used by the elites to, uh, to create a kind of a political destiny for themselves rather than for the benefit of all the communities that we may be talking about. And here we find that uh, the, the, the the, 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 the elites who, are, who tend to be dominating the so-called ethnic politics in the, in the northeastern India tend to be westernized educated elites and tend to have kind of a notion about the governance of the state, which is absent in the context of their own uh, members of, the, uh, members of the, uh, their own ethnic community or members of other ethnic communities. So there, there is a kind of a lack of understanding about the way that, this, uh, that the western uh, Westminster style of governance, that is democracy and the Europe, Eurocentric state uh, is governed and which tends to uh, create some kind of a disagreement amongst the people uh, who tend to be uh, found to be enmeshed in any kind of a violent conflict. Then we also find that uh, the that uh, the uh, when when northeastern India has been uh, northeast India has had the kind of a uh, you know from say from 1972 onwards we have had a kind of a statehood movement where most of the states have come up in the later stages. But we find that the kind of a governance which has been adopted by the respective state governments. I'm not saying that it is not present in the rest of the India, but when you talk of Northeast India, we find that Northeast India tends to be practicing a kind of a politics which is typical, uh, typically uh, not very prominent in the rest of India, which is known as patrimonialism. Because here we find that most of the politics that is being practiced uh, within, the, within any particular state in the North India tends to be more patrimonial, more based on patronage, then we find in the rest of India. We know that democracy is also a kind of a, a patron client relationship because where economy, economic interests tend to uh, tend to drive our way of governance and where uh, we tend to be removed away from politics, which is the welfare of all, tend to be more based on patron relationship uh, in, uh, in, in any kind of a contest. But when you talk of North East India, we find that most since uh, there since uh, any ethnic community, uh, el elite from any any ethnic community who tends to be in the position of power tend to practice a patronage politics, which tends to make the other ethnic communities residing within that particular geographical uh, territory called state uh, far removed, alienated from the state politics, which he 
or see uh, the community that hope for working in their own favor so here we find uh, the, the, the here we find that the uh, probably the, the that probably this kind of a uh, political process which is being followed by the so called elites tend to be responsible for the creation of it, for the creation and perpetuation of ethnic boundaries that are present in our own india today and, and today uh, even after having uh, even after having so many years of uh, education liberal education that we have had and 75 years of india's independence we still find people tend to be talking about their own ethnic origin and tend to be talking about race and ethnicity rather than tend to talk of talk of any other modern identity which um, modern communities modern ethnic communities of the rest of the world tend to have acquired for their own form i think you know uh, why we talking about it because we know that that the, the the development history in the own country tends to have not been same in case of the whole uh, india in case of different regions here we find that when you talk of north east india we all understand that because of lack of development there is ample there is a kind of a abundance of poverty while in a position to abundance of plenty because uh, there is abundance of poverty there is also uh, we find the politics of exclusion tend to be followed we also find there is a kind of a tremendous uh, not only lack of rights and and uh, rights of uh, rights and equitable uh, rights uh, and uh, equitable development for the people that seems to be also a kind of a discriminatory way of development practices which are being followed where we find that within the uh, within the region the certain areas tend to be uh, developed much faster than the areas which are left to develop much later and that seems to this that tends to perpetuate the feelings of discrimination tends that let that also tends to uh, lead us uh, lead people to have a sense of feeling of alienation from their own uh, political system which has been uh, in practice within their own state within the court liberal democratic political system and we are find that uh, that uh, the people tend to be deprived of the rights and they tend to be also kept away from the rights of uh rights of uh, right based development model where each community depending uh, in keeping with their um uh, their level of uh, non development should have been paid more attention to but uh, that is being neglected simply in the name of uh, lack of funds and in the name of uh, lack of any kind of a demand and that tends to be responsible for the kind of demand politics that we talk about in the north east india i think you know although in the beginning we saw there was a demand for dem new separate statehood which we saw will be bringing an end to any kind of differences that may be existing amongst the uh, different communities who, who are residing in the region but we find that that uh, due to due to gross neglect of development and also reaching out uh, to people uh, in in the way of the developmental gains the, the, these identities tend to have become more and more accentuated so today uh, when you talk about north east india we'll find that people tend to talk of their respective identity will because that also seems to give them some kind of a political orientation i'm not talking of power power is obviously comes with the orientation but but uh, when you talk of this kind of uh, uh, separate segregated communities in terms of ethnicity we tend to find that we ourselves are probably uh, keeping uh, taking uh, keeping ourselves away from the so called modern day development which although it is classified by competitive capitalism however we should not uh we should not think that we should we, we are not there to compete and we should rather uh, be able to get things uh, you know get things by somebody's favor and we know that this kind of a favoritism which is known as patronage tends to complicate the political processes much more than what is promised by constitution and we all understand that uh, that uh, india's growth story has never been the same and uh, given the fact that the depend the politics is certainly a vote bank politics and where people or people or communities they will uh, will have to group themselves into some kind of a new political identity in order to be able to command the attention of the political leaders the decision makers in terms of their uh, vote share people uh, in the northeast to, will have to uh, become more political than what they are uh, today that is non political i know in certain areas they are they are more uh, political but then that political seems to be more based on personal interest than based on the social interest and when we talk of north east india we tend to we need to understand that given the fact that there are there have been peace accords which have taken place in order to uh, solve the problem of the region but how our peace accords have not been uh, able to uh, be the answer to the problems of all the ethnic communities or, or, or even to the members of the members within the ethnic communities where we find that that any peace accord which is signed by Uh, signed with the government by certain 
by certain members of the leaders of the ethnic community tend to be uh, overtaken by the militants who tend to destroy those records and tend to demand and uh, a new kind of secessional uh, politics which tend to complicate the way of governance in the region and here you know and uh, whenever I, I think when you talk of research in the region we tend to understand that uh, uh, and uh, i have seen in my own way in my own ways that probably you know people tend to uh, tend to also not try to go into kind of newer areas which could intermingle with our own understanding about our own region about our own society about our own practices about our own beliefs about our own senses or uh, knowledge systems where by interacting with the with the external modern uh, i'm not saying post modern post modern is a different question altogether because you know modern kind of systems where the knowledge which could be gained by doing research into our own communities would be more self enriching than than self denying why it our self denying because you know whenever we talk about ethnicity we people tend to start finding out as if you know some kind of a some kind of a glory which is involved in the studying of our own history with regard to our own ethnic communities so here i think when you talk of research we need to also understand that that given the fact that the ethnic communities the tribal communities are not at the same level of economic development today compared with 1947 we find that among the tribal communities there has been a sizable growth of elites india not only boasts of 500 uh, millions of uh, middle class in the country as as classified by us uh, uh, fortune but we also have within the 500 million uh, people of middle class origin we also have a sizable section of from northeast who tend to be belonging to the middle class and if i am permitted to say even to the upper middle class within the so called indian economic story so here we find that uh, so when you talk of the elites uh, with them so why are you talking of this growth of middle class within the uh, so called uh, within court as was perceived by economically backward uh, you know uh, tribal uh, communities we find that the growth of middle class tend to be Uh, representing some kind of an economic boom and more importantly if you go to the marxian paradigm class formation we are you know previously we all say tribals are uh, tribal population tend to be egalitarian in belief and i don't think that there is thing anything egalitarian today and i have seen that i think if you if you go by the new newspaper reports uh, last year uh, among the uh, among the highly expensive uh, automobiles which were bought uh, four wheelers or cars as you say Uh, were bought by indian population uh, 20, you know cars more than 25 lakhs were bought by 25 lakhs people from northeast so that shows that the size of the middle class and their economic wealth has also grown to a great extent which tends to point to our attention nothing but growth of class system class of as marx tends to divide the society into two classes haves and have nots and here we find that uh, not everybody is not on the equal economic level of either you call it growth or or lack of growth but there has been a sizable growth of middle class who tend to have tend to command much more wealth in india in indian society and and within code within their own respective society or ethnic uh, community then we can think of so here you know and in in the kind of research that we see in the northeast by the various research scholars and also the intelligence i do not see that there is an integration of such kind of a class formation or class basis into their own research people still tend to believe you know i don't know i i also read in the paper uh, i may not be a tribal as should as should say but but uh, having lived in the northeast i am no less a tribal human being than anybody else my color may be different uh, you know i look like a carolite that's a different issue but but uh, but by by staying here you become a part of their society and that is where i think uh, it's a it's a question of integration and where you find that uh, the the class formation or the class uh, notion is never permitted uh, never allowed to be permitted into the any research that we tend to talk about and uh, and every research that is being uh, talked about in the case of ethnicity or in the case of north east any any theme that you talk about we tend to uh, the, we tend to still have the same uh, no paradigm as if you know it is like the center versus the periphery we know that people like the book where they say the periphery strikes back everybody would like to Uh, see that the region any region uh, you know by, by this only by the uh, by the uh, by the resources which are uh, which are uh, embedded in the society are made use of and uh, the economic boom is the boom is allowed to take place but nonetheless we need to uh, understand that the 
that the egal so called egalitarian belief that we have been practicing uh, as the as the value of the ethnic community or or in uh, ethnic community within the northeast tends to be not true people tend to be based on differentiate from each other in terms of class formation uh, and in terms of their position of wealth and we find there is probably a kind of a huge uh, economy gap which has uh, come up uh, between the members of the same community and amongst the tribal communities in the whole region and where uh, by looking at those class formation we will be probably be able to understand the so called social reality as it is existing in the northeast then what has been going on today and the you know and uh, if you talk about ethnic uh, politics we talk about and also we need to remember the democratic politics by its own nature tends to be rather not united but rather fragmented which tends to divide people and tends to give rise to tends to create uh, elites within uh, that particular community and and uh, by 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 its own nature that elite tends to become far removed from the members of their own ethnic community rather than become rather than remain one with uh, with the with the members of the same community so you know democracy by nature is fragmented democracy by nature tends to be segregated and democracy tends to be uh, tends to be rather uh, more division oriented than u- unity and here you know although uh, you know when you talk of unity we may be understanding that well uh, you know we talk of unity of population u- unity of country well the unity of country what you talk about in terms of geography but it doesn't say uh unity in terms of people you know, uh, within the own uh, within a one particular country or within one particular uh, state or within a one particular society will be at the same level of economy uh, as could be found in case of other people so here when you talk of this class formation you need to i think when you start looking at uh, this uh, class basis of any action be it political social or uh, be it uh, uh, be it economic we will probably be able to understand as to why Uh, as to how we tend to become we tend to have been uh, pushed behind in the context of the uh, growth or progress story of the country or of the region rather than what it is being projected to us i think you know in that this case also we'll we we'll have to see that i could see that from the north is lot of people a uh, lot of young people tend to be technology oriented and they tend to use technology not only in their own education but, but also in their own employ in the kind of the context employment in the context of their own economic activities and i think more and more use of technology should also be uh, should also be helpful to us to uh, to understand and change our own traditional beliefs i think you know there is a tremendous pressure on 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 the on the population belonging to lesser developed ethnic communities to stick to the so called uh, you know local customs i think culture is all right culture is very good but then that culture should not be uh, should not be pushed to the level of being the custody of a few members of the community and rather than being practiced as a kind of a universal value within that particular community i think you know and then and and if that if the cultural practices are probably followed that will lead to more uh, cultural preservation and promotion of a local culture which includes folk culture rather than the culture that we talk about in a limited category and uh, i think uh, i've seen when i pass through assam i've seen that uh, you know I, i we talked of feminism in the beginning i think i don't have much time to go into feminism but i understand how uh, what is the activity of feminism and what feminism should do to make everyone uh, feminist i think you know there is uh, no harm in everybody turning into feminist simply because that whosoever supports the cause of the downtrodden the marginalized the neglected section of the indian society which includes women is a feminist so you know even as a male if somebody becomes a feminist there should not be no harm to Uh, there is no shame to be attached to being a feminist because you are you are as an educated person we are trying to uh, fight for the for the rights of the people uh, including uh, people within code women who probably have been downtrodden marginalized and and uh, in a way excommunicated from indian community where they are being uh, not being given equal place in our own society as they should deserve but you know when you, when you go through assam i find that that the traditional costume uh, which is a part of the traditional culture of assam tends to be more practiced by the girls than by the boys when you go through the coed schools you find that the girls tend to use mekhla chadar and then we don't find that the boys uh, tend to uh, wear uh, dhoti kurta or dhoti shirt as was the local costume so here you know the the and, and here in in our own research i think we need to also there is a, we need to also break the boundaries i think in the case of feminism 
we have the saying of going beyond the glass ceiling right you all know that if a woman becomes the president woman becomes the prime minister woman becomes the uh, cmd of uh, hp 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 uh, hewlett packard or tends to become the uh, indian uh, in the chief of indian operation of uh, coca cola or, or pepsi or in fine uh, anywhere we tend to say that breaking the glass ceiling so we need to also break our own boundaries in the context of our own uh, own traditional idioms like culture if cul and the culture preservation can be done more and more when we tend to uh, make it a kind of a value which is practiced by all i think you know and if our research tends to focus on this critical aspect and rather than merely stereotype the kind of uh, writing or research that has been done so far i think that is going to not be useful for us and that is where uh, and uh, and then I, i that is where i think our research would be and in the when you talk of pandemic i think you know uh, i think uh, we have to have two more themes so which is what we know about globalization we talk of global village today today when you talk about globalization we know globalization is tends to be pushing the kind of economic integration of the societies or, or the countries as if you like uh, into to big to form one particular union or, or what is known as a common market where probably people will have to people are being forced to uh, to to get accustomed to uh, the economic habits in terms of purchases and consumption of western goods which are being produced by the so called multinational companies of the west west or mostly multinational companies of the europe and where we are uh, under more threat of loss of culture than loss of our consumption habits we are we are we are, i know we have uh, we are more into western consumption but the more, more consumption of the western cultural idioms will be more damaging to us than uh, than what we tend to merely believe in western consumption i think you know and our research uh, if we are talking of our uh, preservation of ethnic identity i know identity politics tend to be played in the context of political processes in a negative manner and uh, although it has been presented in a positive manner because more and more you find the elites tend to uh, tend to grab more and more economic uh, benefits that are that they can amass through their participation in the governance process but uh, here we need to uh, understand that uh, the cultural preservation probably would be more of a kind of a salient pillar of any kind of an identity Uh, in case of any ethnic community that we are able to think of i think in this context our research will also have to uh, you know we'll have to uh, orient ourselves to the kind of globalization processes which are on and where the communities uh, not only will need to be enabled by by the genesis of new knowledge for their own preservation but they should also be able to uh, gain strength in terms of the uh, their participation in the new uh, processes of knowledge generation which would we should help the community more than what it is today and uh, in this context we find that the that in, you know, when you talk of pandemics we try, we find that the pandemics probably although it is being uh, thought of a kind of a neo liberal agenda uh, where we find that more and more resources are being now siphoned off from the from the uh, poorer country to the rich country we know that which are the which are the pharma companies which are trying to sell us the vaccine india might have uh, made the vaccine but the vaccine tends to have come from come from oxford or astrazeneca and and also you find pfizer other things are come now india has five types of vaccines but the vaccines tend to be the tend, tend to be owned by the so called pharma companies of the west and how the pharma companies tend to now uh, stand to gain more profit earn more profit by selling their vaccines in the context of the pandemic than what they used to gain uh, before so here in the context of pandemic we find that not only there is a kind of a near resource flow which is taking place from the from the periphery to the center as, as was the case during the during the heydays of capitalism or we call it imperialism we find now today that uh, under pandemic all kind of identities are now being merged in the context of uh, the need for survival and when you talk of survival it's not survival of the survival of the uh, person per se it also tends to involve uh, the questions of survival of communities it also tends to involve questions of survival of the nation state or you, if you like country it also tends to involve what is needed survival of or what is called the so called cultural unity of the respective ethnic communities uh, different communities who tend to be residing in under our own earth and which also tends to uh, tends to involve the 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 notion of climate i think you know during the covid we might think that that uh, the covid tends to merely result in the in the killing of people but the but we find that the same burning of people or 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 burning them under the earth tend to be tend to be also associated with the so called climate change which is 
uh, which is now being seen increasingly in our in our own earth and which also needs to be paid attention to i think when you talk about i think when you talk of uh, and uh, the question may be arising in the mind that how does uh, ethnicity tend to interact with the climate change or we or with the so called uh, you know the uh, with the so called uh, global climate management which has been talked about i think you know here we find that uh, in the earlier days when there was no science i think science came up uh, very late in the 20th century uh, or or you know, not or slightly to be in late 19th century but we find before late 19th century also the ethnic communities were also uh, were also very much uh, uh, existing in our own earth and uh, you know if we at all we earth when there was no uh, science there was no scientific instruments to talk of the weather to talk of uh, any other kind of a uh, any other kind of warning system we find that the traditional knowledge system uh, was very much uh, very much present with the so called with the, with the with the elders of the various ethnic communities through uh, through that knowledge they were able to they were able to uh, forecast whether there will be there will be a, there will be rain there will be flood or there will be there will be drought and there will be any other climatic disaster so that uh, you know that traditional knowledge system which is still found in our own in our own uh, various ethnic uh, in the members of the ethnic communities also need to be uh, need to be preserved and also then to be promoted and and the, the promotion can only be done uh, and why it has become urgent it's only because that we have found the modern day living not only uh, although it may have become very very comfortable it may have become very very convenient for us but it has also at the same time become very very expensive today when you go to uh, buy medicines in the market i think even a painkiller cost you not less than 20 rupees and then uh, not only one tablet is prescribed there are also many many more uh, medicines are prescribed which tends to uh, you know even for a small headache you are going to spend not less than 200 rupees which was there uh, which was only 2 rupees or less than or 1/10th or or one hundredth of it uh, when we were small ch children, and that uh, and that, that has come up because that by the by the by the by the theft of the knowledge system and also by doing active research on the on the traditional knowledge system and the traditional medicinal system that were exist that were present in our own communities tend to have been taken away by the by the so called uh, Western uh, scientific scientific uh, elites and they tend to be again converting the same ideas into West, into some little bit of mechanized products. And uh, and tend to sell us at a higher price, which again tends to uh, be responsible for the for the rising level of poverty within different com ethnic communities in our own country. And that way, you know, when you talk of traditional knowledge system, when you talk of traditional medicine preservation of traditional medicine systems, the, I think they also need to be given uh, given a lot of boost if at all we have to survive in a community. So here, when you talk of uh, you know uh, talk of ethnicity. And why do we have to rethink about the ethnicity? You know, the, the argument that is to be uh, kept in mind is that we have to rethink our own boundaries. Most of, most of the knowledge system that we tend to be familiar with tend to be self-created. You know, if you talk about a boundary of a country, it is also artificial because somebody has done it and people have accepted it, but it, must, it is likely to change. And so also our knowledge system uh, should be also be uh, reflect, should also be accepted as something which is not very limited it is limited for the time being but but the but the more we uh, the more we are driven by the curiosity to learn the more we'll be able to push our own boundaries i think you know and uh, when you talk of ethnicity in case of northeast india instead of being instead of being bound uh, to our own respective uh, ethnic community uh, either in search of you know in search of sort of glorifying the kind of present day practices and and, and also in search in search of not Trying to bring up the negative practices which need to be which which need to be uh, refined and uh, and reformed in the in, in in accordance with the demand of the time uh, should also be uh, kept in mind and that you know and these boundaries are where you do, when you talk of a community you know it is a, it's a self created boundary knowledge is a self created boundary and also our uh, our way of looking at a particular problem is also self created I think the the desire in the modern day 21st century is that we need to uh, develop adequate amount of confidence by way of knowledge that we are able to come up to come up with the come up with new ideas which will not only be able to uh, hit or to uh, attack the uh, traditional negative beliefs which may be hindering our way of growing into very prosperous communities than what we are growing today and i think when you talk of 
this uh, economic growth i mean social social growth we will not be talking of because social growth people tend to develop uh, aided by the economic uh, motivations or you call it economic factors but we need to understand that these economic factors they tend to play uh, play an important role in the context of uh, entrenchment of traditional boundaries of ethnicity is primarily driven by the so called economic practices i think you know uh, i do not know when you read the Uh, literature today if you read the western literature you'll be able to, you'll be probably be able to come across the females the women trying to you know trying to venture into all kinds of all kinds of uh, socio economic roles that are available in that given society and are trying to do much better for themselves i think you know but in the case of our own research we don't see that uh, anybody talking about uh, any kind of a women successor And, and women success in in various uh, disciplines i think you know and and also one needs to also understand as to why women have not succeeded the same uh, women from northeast do not succeed in northeast indian societies and they have to and while they succeed in uh, in the rest of the india you to go to bombay you go to delhi you find the uh, ample uh, you know plenty of people both men and women boys and girls from northeast doing well for themselves and trying to compete with the rest of the india whom you whom we feel educated um, and trying to do much better than them than the others in various spheres of life but you know and here the kind of social boundaries which tend to exist within the communities also need to be broken uh, need to be broken off simply because you know i i think whenever you talk of you whenever we talk of uh, social boundaries we tend to think probably our society tends to be much more Uh, our society tends to be much more uh, tends to be much man just one minute so here you know sorry i disturbed you so here you know we need to whenever you talk of uh, research we need to uh, we need to also um, come into come face to face with the reality as to Uh, what are the factors that tends to the the what are factors that they tend to hamper or or hinder a person both the men and women from going up in their own way towards the dream of success then what is happening today so you know when the way i look at uh, the various social categories include ethnicity that i know i don't you know we tend to be looking at it we need to understand the modern orientation we need to combine the modern beliefs the modern practices with our own traditional beliefs which we find will be a kind of a heady combination where we find that the knowledge that is generated uh, from the region will probably be of much more uh, help and much more uh, will prove to be much more uh, sanguine than what we tend to borrow from the uh, from the research of the uh, rest of india and that is where we by by looking at each one of us uh, as a good researcher and also by looking by 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 trying to uh, bring in the kind of a rebel instinct amongst us who are willing to break down the social chains you know and and trying to come up with newer kind of knowledge newer understanding about the subject that is available in the north east india would be would be would be more useful to the society of north east and the rest of india than what we find today and uh, when we talk of the social chains we i think i we are remember by uh, by rousseau's quote i think you must have come across a political thinker Uh, who was a contractualist uh, and who was a french philosopher who learned from his lessons from voltaire his name is jean jacques rousseau and jean jacques rousseau in, in his own political philosophy tends to have said that man, mankind is born free man is born free but everywhere he is in chains and these chains as we as he talked about chain chains is again uh, during the time rousseau who wrote in 1789 uh, post 1789 french revolution period tends to uh, be also present today where we find that all the uh, all the knowledge that is being passed on to us uh, should be treated as like chains rather than a kind of rather than wings which will help us to go into newer areas of research rather than rather than come into uh, rather than uh, being uh, limited to the traditional as old uncritical uh, and also to an extent unscientific beliefs that are permeating in our own society i i think i will end here i do not know whether i made sense or not but this is how uh, as a researcher for 25 years in the north east india and uh, i think that the i i thought that the ethnic boundaries uh, need to be looked at and uh, there was no time to go into a pandemic but i think when i come back later when you talk of gender will probably make it more uh, research oriented than what it is today thank you thank you so much sir definitely it
you know uh, we got a, you you gave us a lot to think about because you not only address the problems about this idea of ethnicity in northeast but you know you also gave us new directions like how to think about it or the kind of solutions that we need to like like me right so um i uh, there are some participants who have been you know um, posting their comments and they are in complete agreement with you uh, so they have been writing certain things and uh, is jitu bora here jitu kumar bora yes ma'am okay uh, so i uh, request jitu kumar bora to uh, summarize and conclude sir's lecture thank you thank you ma'am for giving me the opportunity to summarize sir's lecture sir is talking about the diversity biodiversity and dialect dialects of the north east india how different community makes india in one india as referred in the indian india's preamble sir is talking about how india is a multi communal multi ethnic country and how all the people of india works brotherhoodly how different community focuses more and more of their own of showing their own identity so also speaks about the ethnicity and how tribals migrated to india from south east asia how political boundaries are very artificial during british rule and during pre independent india before giving independence how artificial boundaries were made by britishers in case of india and burma as well so also speaks how multicultural identity differs from multi ethnic identity so also speaks about political leaders rule the rule of political leaders in pre independence and post independent india and sir also speaks about how in 1992 india adopted look east policy how our own story will have to be told to the rest of india then about six idl how idl is proposed for four state how six idl is by the rest of india then sir speaks about democracy how democracy is not fulfilling the needs of all communities of entire india as well as north east india he also refers how different ethnic groups have been created for their own cultural and political benefit in india we see plenty on one side and poverty in other these are the reasons why different communities are demanding for uh, separate states India has the 500 million middle class families which shows for economic growth of India in comparison with Asia in comparison with USA United States of America so also speak how during this pandemic time during this covid-19 pandemic time the european countries are selling vaccines to india in high rates so which shows their capitalist characters therefore ethnic communities and need to be preserved we can go with traditional knowledge system traditional medicine system of different communities which will help us from buying medicines from uh, our from other countries thank you sir for giving us a fruitful presentation i think it will surely help all of us thank you thank you jitu kumar bora for beautifully summing up sir's lecture of course you know sir gave us so much to think about uh, it's not easy to summarize everything but then you touched upon some key points so thank you for that uh, sir uh, uh, thank you so much because you know the, the the topic of ethnicity because it's so important especially for the people of north east and uh, as you said you know 
your uh, your 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 uh, your perspectives your your valuable insights definitely will help us and also the participants you know to uh, to you know to conduct research because students of literature also are very interested in this idea of ethnicity and since northeast literature is something that is uh, coming up and you know that has been included in uh, the syllabus of various universities here so definitely you know students are very really interested in uh, you know addressing this idea of ethnicity right so uh, def so that is why from your point of view you know how you talk about ethnicity as a as a, as a political scientist that was something very um, rich and very interesting for us so so we hope that um, uh you know in the coming lectures also we will we will uh, we will be uh, benefited by your uh, valuable insights we will be benefited by your honorable lectures sir so thank you sir thank you once again and uh, hope to meet you soon sir thank you pratu sir thank you participants uh, I, i think i must uh, i forgot to thank the organizer and pratu sir for having organized the program i i find in academia also that somewhere you know we always see that more activities are being done from outside than from inside sir, uh, so that way you know sir, all the things organized but it's quite good sir uh, can you hear me sir yes sir yes, yes sir, you can hear me i have work sir sir yes please sir uh, as just i want to know since you were talking about the different uh, boundaries or the ethnic conflicts of the north is basically i want to uh, ask one thing related with the state boundaries that is suddenly there is a the boundary conflicts i have resumed suddenly from uh, basically this uh, pandemic period there is a boundary conflict between the nagaland and assam mizoram and assam and uh, meghalaya and assam so actually from from your observation so why suddenly at a time uh, this kinds of the boundary conflicts uh, uh, has uh, taken place because earlier what we have observed is that some or other uh, nagaland and assam it may be there and uh, sometime in uh, meghalaya so there is a, a, a game of the time but now suddenly we have seen that at a time uh, so there is a, a boundary conflict with the assam so why so uh, uh, can you uh, tell something about that sir uh, what the reason is there what any kind of uh, hidden political agenda or the policy is there to uh, the problematize that kind of boundary with assam well you know i think uh, the you know the presence of pandemic might be might be exaggerating the problem but we should understand that this uh, the so called existing boundaries which have been delimited in case of various states as they came up uh, after uh, from out of the division of assam tend to be rather decided by the Uh, by the parliament you know under article uh, we, we all know that parliament is the uh, agency which tends to decide the boundaries and in case of most of the northeast states you talked about meghalaya assam meghalaya does have the border dispute uh, not to not uh, today it has happened right from the day meghalaya came up and uh, we also find that mizoram issue only flared up but then nagaland issue had been coming up very soon we also saw when i was in manipur uh, manipur also nagaland they also have the same boundary dispute the question here is that you know that uh, when unless the boundaries are complete and we also know that the people belonging to the same ethnic communities tend to be dispersed over across the uh, across the interstate border and which you know and which tends to make it inconvenient for the people to sort of maintain their existing social relations for which uh, you know they they tend to pressurize there is a pressure on the state leadership to settle the border issue and uh, if the border issue came up uh, here it's only because that that it's it's in certain small cases that the that the conflict is uh, the conflict or the difference that exists tends to be exaggerated for certain reasons uh, and by the as we call it by local uh, politicos rather than the local mafia as we say and which tends to pose a greater challenge to the state of governance i think uh, um, it's not are you are muted sir forgot i forgot the so here you know most of the north eastern states uh, would have to Uh, sort of you know come to a kind of a, a governance framework where the boundary disputes should be settled amicably rather than being used to used as a kind of a pawn in the in the so called local politics uh, uh, of the area which tends to complicate the existing uh, social uh, processes and you know assam uh, mizoram although we know that uh, this problem came up but the government of india has also not been uh, not been able to resolve the conflict simply because that the various state governments tend to be 
persistent with their own demand rather than trying to practice a policy of give and take i think you know politics is also when you talk of politics is an art of possibility politics when you talk of the uh, the art of influ uh, using influence uh, which means uh, art of being able to persuade the other people it also involves a policy of give and take but you know here if you think give and take is not possible it's only because that it seems there is a in the in the in the in the in the, in the um, times of say Uh, governance, uh, you know, uh, even dependent governance. What it has led to more of a hardening of boundaries. Uh, you know, boundaries. When you talk of the ethnic bound, ethnic or social boundaries, if you may like to say, rather than trying to you know, lead to a kind of a merge of any kind of differences of entities. You know, you, when you talk of uh, when you talk of uh, citizen of a state, we should be able to uh, think of uh, you know trying to come up with a policy of give and take, some kind of approachment. And not try to harden our own position, which makes it very difficult for in the other party to solve it. Because you know, and we also know in when you talk of Orissa, I primarily I come from Orissa. We also had problem with uh, Bihar. And, you know, if you go to Bihar, you'll also find that some of the Oriya speaking areas are part of Bihar. Some of the Oriya speaking part is now um, part is now uh, uh, they tend to be the portion of the new state called Jharkhand. So here, but even then, we find. that uh, because of the give and take because of the uh, some kind of a political mechanism that the border issue uh, doesn't flare up as much as uh, we do because it may you may try to distinguish between the ethnic uh, identities of the people who live in the in the so called jharkhand and odisha border or Jhar bihar and odisha border than in northeast what is in northeast you know when you talk of 220 thing i think you know uh, as a researcher i would rather like to um, call for breakdown of the hardening stance rather than hardening of entities which makes the uh, problem more complicated than it is solved thank you sir thank you okay sir thank you so much for your valuable time and also answering to all these questions uh, we look forward to your next lecture sir that is uh, coming up within a few days so thank you sir thank you ma'am thank you so much namaskar <laughs>